expect, because this Bible is true, you can expect from the moment you begin to hear this, you can expect doors to open. You can expect family members to start being saved. You can start seeing sickness run out of your body. You can start seeing your finances healed. You can start seeing the power and strength coming into your body again. Because this is the covenant right of the children of God. This is what happens when you sit under the truth. That's why we don't preach any other stuff. Because the gospel is just as powerful to the Christian as it is to the unbeliever. Man, as a Christian, you sit under the gospel and it produces in you. And you don't want to ever go anywhere. That's why I can tell you, that's why in a lot of churches, they claim to preach the truth, but there's no fruitfulness. Man, we're seven weeks old and look at the fruit in your life. And I tell you, surely as the Lord God lives, man, the next seven weeks we will produce even more fruit. And the next seven weeks after that will be even greater fruit because God is faithful because this is what happens when the gospel is preached. I dare you right now to say I'm not ready to be fruitful. Right now, I dare you to declare it. My no's are about ready to be yeses. My no's are yeses. God's going to give me what I don't deserve. God's going to give me what I don't deserve. Let that get in your spirit for a second. When, when, when you're in your week, I want these words to come back to you. God's going to give me what I don't deserve. Mm-hmm. He's going to supply what I couldn't work for. Mm-hmm. Get ready, because you're hearing the word of truth. Mm-hmm. All right, man, I've, I've said enough. Man, you give me about 25 minutes this morning. You give me about 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. We'll get to our series, The Pursuit of Holiness. My man, Rocket, right now, I'm glad you're here, man. I'm happy to be here. Oh, man, yeah. I, I'm telling you, I, I, I feel like you're like my little brother. I, I I met him maybe about two years ago. Yeah, been two years. And uh, man, I got to minister to him in an apartment in uh, Tacoma. Yeah. And God blew his mind. Yeah. And we've 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 been connected ever since. Yeah. And uh, God has made it possible for him to be here. I got an opportunity to meet his awesome lady, Blair. Yeah. Blair, I'm excited about what God's going to do in your life. Yeah. And uh, I want you to know. That man, you're about ready to be introduced to a Jesus that you're going to fall in love with. Because I know that you don't like religion. And God brought you to a place where you're going to be free to really hear the <laughs> truth about the scriptures. And I want you to know, man, get excited because God's about ready to change your life. All right? And we didn't have no side conversation. <laughs> God really does speak to me. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Man, this is part 6 of the pursuit of holiness. I'm going to pray when you guys get there. And then in order to get the, 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 the magnitude of what we are going to talk about, I want to briefly go back two weeks and catch you up so that you can continue the train of thought that we've been going to so that you can see the significance of what we're about ready to say. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. If you're there at Romans chapter 6, you there? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. God, I thank you for the power that I feel in this room. God, I thank you for your victory on the cross. God, I thank you that when you died, it was a complete work that did everything required for both godliness and life. God, I thank you that you are a loving God and that you're a merciful God, that you're a just God. I thank you that you're holy. And I thank you, Father, that you are in passionately pursuing your glory. I thank, I thank you that you love to finish the work that you started. God, take every fiber of religion and purify it from our hearts. God. Every, every lie that has been spoken to us in the name of religion, every deception, God, break it. Set us free. Take it out of us, Lord. And may we be a pure people with the purity of the gospel, with the purity Pure love with a with a real holiness, with a real sanctified life. 
God, use us. God, get your glory in us. God, take it, this, this, this word that we are preaching and bring it before the nations, God. Raise up men and women of God to plant churches and raise up missionaries to go overseas. Raise up, Lord Jesus, men of God and women of God that are going to stand on the truth of the gospel. God, build this church. Father, you said your church is the thing that you build. And unless you build it, Lord, we labor in vain. Yes. God, now as I turn my attention to the scriptures, God, I pray that you would empower me to articulate and to proclaim this message of truth in a manner that's worthy of it. Father, do not allow me to be a reproach to your holy word. But God, grant me the boldness and the power to preach it. For Lord, my, my hope is not in my cleverness, it's not in my wittiness, it's not in my ability to speak, but it rests in your power, God. God, let your power make us alive. Make this word go into our hearts and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, if you can't feel it yet, you're about ready to. I feel the power of God in here. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse number 11 Again, this is uh, the sixth um, a part to our pursuit of holiness. This, this series is probably going to be about 12 weeks. So we are at the halfway point of what it means to be holy. So many times you sit in churches and you hear people tell you to be holy. And they tell you if, you, if you're not holy, you're going to go to hell. And they tell you, uh, they, they, and basically what they do is they take the word holiness and they use it to manipulate you. They use it to control you. They use it to judge you. And what this type of thinking does is it produces a whole bunch of Holy Ghost police in the church. And all they do is run around and point their finger at you. Oh, you got to get that right. Oh, I think you got this going on in your life. Oh, I seen you at the grocery store buying X, Y, and Z. And, 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 so, and people have associated this type of behavior with holiness. And, and my friends, holiness does not have anything to do with the Holy Ghost police running around pointing their finger and judging each other. The word holiness is a word that means to be set apart for the service of God. Man, and what the church needs is it needs more people that are set aside for them, both in their physical being and in their heart, and where they truly have a cry. God, use me. I'm here to do your will. You tell me to go, and I'll go. You tell me to speak, I'll speak. When you tell me to stop, I'll stop. And what has happened is the church has been filled with the people externally that look holy, but in their heart they're still rebellious to the truth of who God is because they have not truly been set apart. Yes. And we are a church where we might not ever look like what the world says we should look like. We might not ever live up to this religious code that people have tried to stamp us with but in our hearts people of God we will be a holy people that are set aside for the work of God we will be a people that is found reigning in the shadows of Seattle we will be found in prayer we will be found with our ears open and our heart willing God if there's something you need done I'm right here and I know, and we might not be the most gifted people. We might not be the most articulate people. We might not be the most politically correct people. But we will be a people that have been empowered supernaturally by God and His Spirit. And when we open our mouth, though we look simple and though we look uneducated, there will be a word inside of us that will destroy the wisdom of the world. There will be a message inside of us that arrests people's hearts and minds. There will be something inside of us that is life changing and transforming. When we speak, it will put a fire inside of people. When we speak, they'll be, my God, I haven't heard about this Christ you talk about. Amen. We are not just a church. We, my friends, are a movement 
We are a people that are going to spread through the earth like fire. We are going to spread through this region like fire, reclaiming this territory Amen. for Jesus Christ that he alone can get the glory. Amen. Yes. We are a people of truth. We are a people of conviction. We are a purple and people of purpose and destiny. Come on. And we are the people that will not be denied. We will not be thrown down. We will not be trampled on. We will not be easily discarded and thrown away. Because God has brought us to this moment in time. And he says to us, because of his finished work on the cross, because he has given you his spirit and made you alive unto him, he says to you, you, Emmaus, you, yeah. child of God, you, son and daughter, you, kings and priests, you, a holy people, you are holy. Yeah. Woo! Not because of your work, not because of your religiosity, not because of your outward posture and your outward appearance, but because of a finished work of Jesus Christ. You are holy. Come on, somebody. Amen. And as we come to part six of what it means to be holy and what it means to pursue holiness, because true holiness is not something you already are, but it's something you are in pursuit of because God has called me holy because he has did this great work in my life, because I'm accepted, because I have favor, because I have access, because I am the righteousness of God. Now there's a permission and a freedom for me to live like I've never lived before. There's a permission to walk in a way that I've never walked, where I used to be a slave behind bars and I couldn't get free. Now I'm free and I am a man on a mission. You are people on a mission so the world will know publicly what he has already did in the secret part of your innermost being. Get ready, church. You're about ready to come out. Yes. Woo! Uh, let's get to the scripture. Romans chapter 6, starting at verse number 11. I want to look at just one verse to start, and then I want to do some review, and then I want to lay the foundation of where we're going. And I want to show you what it looks like. Are you ready? Yes. Romans chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The key to pursuing holiness, the key to growing in holiness, the key to really experiencing the full measure of your holiness is found within the mystery of verse number 11. It's found in the awesome reality of counting yourself, declaring yourself dead to sin, but not just dead to sin, but supernaturally because of the indwelling spirit of God, I have been made alive unto him. Yes. Woo! See, religion teaches you how to be dead to sin. But it does not equip you and arm you with the necessary understanding so you can be alive unto God. Amen. See, a lot of people in a lot of churches, you hear them talk about dying. And the church needs to get past dying to the world, dying to sin, dying to lust, dying to worldliness. And we need to move past that. And get on to living holy, living righteous, living in power, walking in love, walking in forgiveness, walking in a manner of freedom and purpose and destiny. And it's right in this place. Do so I want to rest the next 15 or 20 minutes and really drive home what it means to live unto God? Come on, somebody. It's one thing to say it. And it's another to live in. Two weeks ago, uh, we learned that we were slaves to sin. Uh, we, we learned that not only were we slaves to sin, 
but in slavery we committed our sins. We visited the words of Jesus when Jesus said, the man who sins, the reason why he sins is because he is a slave to sin. Sin is not something that you ever truly have the freedom to choose not to do it or choose something then else because in your sinful nature the nature that you were born because of fallen humanity because of the fallen creation you were born under the weight and the law of sin and the reason why you did the things that you did and the reason you do the things that you do is because my friends you are a slave you're bound up now, the church is trying to tell you that you have a free will in this place and it's your responsibility to simply choose to be better you need to choose to live better you need to choose God but my friends the problem with this horrific and heretical teaching of free will is that my friends Jesus said you are a slave and my friends how can you have a free will when you are a slave uh, by definition a slave has had his will suppressed that his will is no longer his own, but someone more powerful, someone stronger, someone greater has inflicted and imposed their will on their life. We learned that the person doing this is, is, is the devil. In Ephesians chapter 2, we, we, we read that it's the spirit of the prince of the air who, get, who has, has controlled you by his spirit. And, and, and the children who are disobedient, they're disobedient because they're in con being controlled by the devil. So when you are being controlled by the devil, you, my friends, you are not free, but you are a slave. We developed uh, in this place of slavery sinful habits. Uh, regardless of how good we were trying to be, we learned that we are stuck being the very thing that we despise. We, we found ourselves with no power, no permission, no strength to really bust out of the bondage of sin and really to begin to live free. This is the reason why so many of us have been without joy. This is the reason why so many of us have never known peace, why we've never known love, why we have never been able to enjoy life. And this is the reason why, is the reason why is because you're stuck, you're controlled, you're enslaved. And even if I long to be better, I couldn't be better. And even if I long to quit, I couldn't quit. And I'm stuck in this place and I don't have the freedom to get out. And what happens is, is in that message, I developed the idea that we have been sinners so long that our identity and who we are has begun to be defined by our place of slavery. Uh, isn't that crazy that how it is that the that sin can deceive us so much we can be slaves, but yet we begin to find an identity in our slavery and our new identity tricks us yes. into thinking we're really free when the truth is we're really bound. It's like goldfish. A goldfish thinks that he is discovering the, the, the greatness of the world swimming swimming around in a little tank. You're like, whoa, look at those beautiful rocks. Whoa, look at that little fairy that blows bubbles. Whoa, look at the little castle to make one lap around the pool. Comes back around. Whoa, look at the bubbles out of the fairy. Whoa, look at the and he doesn't even know that he's a slave. Man, that is the place that we have been stuck in. Abusive relationships, abusive families, addicted to substances. All we know is anxiety. All we know is depression. And we have been in this place so long that it begins to become your identity. This is all there is to life. This is all there is to living. This is all there is to happiness. This is what relationships are supposed to look like. Dysfunction really isn't dysfunction. It is the norm. And so as slaves, we have bought in to this type of thinking. Uh, two weeks ago, as we progressed in our thought of about being slaves to sin, we came to Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It reads, 
For we know that our old self was crucified with him. Who was the old self? The old self was us who was in our slavery, oppressed, stuck, with no power, and we have been crucified with him. The him there is capital H. It's talking about Jesus. That literally the idea is when Jesus died on the cross, man, the people of God that have confessed Christ as their Lord and Savior, when he died, we died with him, right? Uh, so we have been crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. That we should no longer be slaves to sin, but because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So we learned the only way to escape this religion, this slavery, this sinful place that we cannot be free, where we have been living beneath our privilege, and this place where, where we have looked at dysfunction as the norm. The only way to escape the power and dominion and rule of this place was literally to die. That's when I began to talk about two weeks where you can run and you can make yourself look better, but when you take your shirt off, you still are branded as a slave. And it doesn't matter who, what you pretend to be, it's not, it doesn't matter what you try to act out, you always, when you come to that place of nakedness, when you come to that truth about who you are, you've been branded and identified as a slave. But when you die, that flesh began to fade away. And when you died and that flesh fades away, that which has branded you is no longer there. The thing that has restrained you no longer has power. That place that has dominated you no longer can dominate you because in the death of Jesus, the power and dominion of sin has been broken. Right? Uh, we kept on going and we say, we seen so our being joined to Christ in his death, disarmed and broke the power of sin and dominion off of us. Then we uh, discovered last week that even though the power of sin has been broken off of us, evil is still right there with me. Mm. Woo! Now watch this. As, as, as we learned two weeks ago that when we died in Christ, the power and dominion has been broken. We got really excited. We're like, man, I'm ready to live free. Man, I'm ready to begin to experience life. I'm ready to walk in the abundance of everything God has. I'm ready for joy, peace, happiness. I'm ready for, for the blessing. I'm ready to make progress only to discover even though the power of sin and the dominion of sin has been broken, evil and sin is still very much with you. See, what we one of the biggest misunderstandings of the cross is that when Jesus died, he died, and when you accepted him, he removed sin from you. Right? And they tell you that's what being free from sin means. It means that you are without sin. And what religion does is they capitalize on this misunderstanding and they teach you by doing the right combination of religious disciplines, you can get to a place in your life you can be without sin. Right? Sitting in the right church under the right leader with the right revelation, with the right amount of prayer time, the right amount of fasting, combination with the right amount of worship mixed with the amount of prayer and a little bit of accountability, and you get the mix right. You can live in a sweet place called sin free. The problem with this is the Bible says in 1 John, soon as you claim to be without sin, you are a liar. Wow. So preachers are trying to get you to a place so you can be the ultimate liar. <laughs> They're teaching you how to pray, fast, read, promising that you can be without sin, just so you can look at God and have God say, you liar, sin is still with you. We got this, we got this uh, from Romans chapter 7, verse 21. Uh, last week it says, this is the Apostle Paul again, he says, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, Evil is right there. See, now now watch this. When you were a slave to sin, 
You didn't want the things of God. You didn't desire the things of God. You didn't want holiness. You didn't want his blessing. You didn't want his peace. You didn't want his joy. But now because the power of sin has broken off of you, now there is a freedom to begin to long for these things. And see, and that's where we're at as a church. Man, God, because of his grace, has saved you, separated you, redeemed you, broke the power of sin off of your life. And now there is a longing to live better. There's a longing in you to be free. There's a longing to know joy and to have peace, right? But you're finding quickly that sin is still there. <laughs> right? And so you're stuck in this place where how can I really be free if sin is still present? Right? How can I be set free? How could the power and dominion of sin be truly broken off of me if it's still right there? And my friend, this is the answer. Though the power of sin is broken and you are no longer a slave, you still very much are in a dog fight to be free. But now your fight is not to get free, but your fight is to remain free. Woo! See, religion is always telling you, you need to get free. Come up to the altar and let us lay hands on you and you can be free. Right? Listen to this and you'll be free. No, if you have experienced Jesus, if you have accepted him, if his spirit has come and made you alive, you're not trying to get free. You're trying to stay free. And you have to understand that it's in this conflict. See, the devil wants you to think that that sin that is always with you has enslaved you still. That he wants you to think that it's still binding you. And it's still hindering you. But you have to understand through the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are free. You are liberated. Right? And so we can't mistake the presence of sin in our life as the thing that rules us, masters us. But we have to see it as the thing that is desiring to remove us from freedom. Amen. Who, your true fight is not to be free. Your true fight is to keep yourself free. Mm-hmm. See, and, and if, if you're going to understand your pursuit of holiness, you have to understand that God in his wisdom saw fit to leave this eternal fight there. Mm-hmm. So why would God set me free just to keep me in a conflict? Right? Because this is where the devil gets you. This is what wears you out. It's in your day-to-day conflict of trying to be free. Do you get tired? You get worn out? You get frustrated? You get overwhelmed? You say, this stuff don't work. Right? I need to fix and alter my scenario. I need to get my combinations different. Right? And some people even say, man, I tried this God thing. It's not what it says it is. God's not real. I don't believe. Right? So what does it mean to be alive unto God? Watch this. What does it mean? Though we are in an everyday dogfight, God hasn't left us in a state of neutrality. He has delivered us from sin's reign, and now we have been brought into the reign of his son. Listen, when when you have became alive unto God, this is what he's saying, because of the finished work of Jesus Christ, you not only are not just no longer a slave to sin, but he has taken you all the way out of that place. And now he has anchored you in a place where you're a slave of righteousness. See, God didn't just take you out to leave you neutral. And you you don't fight this fight in a neutral place. You don't fight this fight against sin in a neutral place where I'm trying to gain God. I'm trying to gain his favor. I'm trying to gain his, his blessing in my life. But he has taken you all the way from extreme right and then put you all the way extreme left. He has brought you all the way out of the world, 
all the way into the kingdom, brought you all the way out of unforgiveness, all the way into forgiven, taking you all the way out of sinner, all the way to holy, taking you all the way from a slave, all the way to a son. And now it's in this place of being in the presence of God. Does the devil try to remove you from sonship, remove you from blessing, remove you from joy, remove you from peace? So you're not in a place to get that stuff, but you're in a place to experience it. Yes. Right? So, so, when this, so you're not in a neutral place. Man, what does it mean? I want to read this to you. It says, you're not just dead to sin, but you're alive unto God. You're just not delivered, but you have been brought into the kingdom of light right now. Even though you are in a dog fight with sin. Even though you have this eternal wrestling within you. Even though you have good days and you have bad days. Some days you walk more victorious and some days you're not. You have to understand even in the high mountains and the low valleys, you are a child of God. You are going to be with him in paradise because your hope is not in your ability. Your hope is not in your strength. It's not in your purpose, but it's in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, what is the significance of being alive unto God? How does this help us in our pursuit of holiness? I only have one point and I'm done. What it means to be alive unto God as we are united with Christ in all of his power. When I was dead in my sin with no power to come out and he's brought me all the way out where I'm no longer a slave to sin but now I'm a slave to righteousness one place I didn't have no power and in this place the fullness of God's power as at work in me before I was broke and I couldn't do it but now the full measure of his strength is at work keeping you, sustaining you, living through you, quickening you, even when you wanted to sin, him and his power wipes the table and makes it so the people you sin with won't call you back, yep. the people you drink with won't yep. call you back, the people you get high with will become your enemies. Can you see the power of God that's at work in your life? What it means to be alive to God is you literally, when you were over here in your sin, all of God's power was against you. All of his wrath was against you. He wanted to judge you. He wanted to send you to hell. But now you've been delivered from that place. And where all of his power used to judge you and oppose you, now it's him loving you, giving you grace, sustaining you, picking you up before you even fall. Oh my God. Can you see his power? That even when you begin to stagger on your way down, he quickly snatches you up, says, Stand up, you're mine. Woo! Can you not see Peter getting out of the boat, learning how to live and walk in this life of faith, standing on the boat, and it's shaky? Oh, I don't know if I can trust the gospel yet. It's shaky. I don't know about this grace thing. The waves are big. I don't know if I can walk on that water. I know my mind says I should sink. I know it should drown. I feel like a fool to believe such foolishness foolishness and the wind's blowing Peter and you're rocking back and forth and all of a sudden you begin to take one step out of the boat onto the water and you're struggling for your belt and you're like hey just, just and as you start to say hey look at my works God reminds you it's not your way Peter oh you start to go on just before you can hit the bottom of the water the strong right hand of grace snatches you up out of the water it says come on this is about me giving you the power to do this thank you Jesus why are you going to make it why are you going to overcome the world why are you going to overcome your sin why can you have hope of a better day why do you have hope of joy and peace and love how are we going to overcome this fallen world because the perfect power of God is at work in you. 
Hello, holiness. Ah, I have a permission to pursue him because his perfect power is at work compelling me, keeping me, delivering me. Why do you need to hang out? Why do you need to hear the gospel? The Bible says, because the gospel is the power of salvation to him that believes. How do you experience this place that I'm talking about? Sitting under the truth of the gospel. Amen. You are not going to, oh see, religion says this, I'm not even going to finish. Religion says this, God wants to empower you so you can do the work. Christianity says, your power is because I'm powerful in you. And your power, it cannot be measured by your own works and your own feeble attempts. But the truth and the source of your power, that is me at work in your life. I am the power in you. I am the strength in you. I am the one that overcomes in you. I'm the one that's going to take you home. I'm the one when you should fall down, keeps you standing. I'm the one before you can be bankrupt, keeps you blessed. I'm the one. Amen. My power. The Apostle Paul said, Christ in me is my hope of glory. Because he's in me. He abides in me. And the fullness of his power is at work in me. I have hope of eternal life. Because you can be the strongest and most powerful person in the world. But my friend, you don't have the ability on that day when the trumpet blows to lift yourself up off of this earth and join him in the sky. It's his own power that will bring you to where he is. Why can you have hope today and you're fighting in sin? Because you're not fighting in your own power. Yes. It's his power that's at work in you. Why are you going to be victorious? <coughs> because all of your strength is gone. Can I tell you, there's a reason why you failed so much. There's a reason why you've compromised so long. To show you it's not in your strength. So that you can know the fullness of his power. That's why the Apostle Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. Yeah. Not a strength and power because of himself, but because of God. This week, you're going to know the power of God. This week, in your fight to be holy, and as you see this conflict, no, you're not trying to get free, but you're fighting to stay free, and the reason why you're going to be victorious is because of Him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. I pray, Lord, that you would drive it home, that you would make it plain. I pray that, Lord, you would quicken our hearts to know the fullness of of your power and your glory that's at work in our life. I thank you that we are not a people, Lord, that's trying to overcome the world. But I thank you, Lord, in you we already have overcome the world. Yes. Empower us, Lord, to live holy. In Jesus' name, Jesus amen. Name. Wednesday, 7 o'clock.